So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to get started. My name is Derek T. Dortch. I'm the Director of Career Services and Special Programs here at the Institute of World Politics, and we thank, and we thank everybody for coming out today. We're going to have a special program, one of many that we've had already, but with our special partner, the Marine Corps University Foundation. We want to thank them for allowing this to, and making this a reality for us. Let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Donald Bishop, he's the brand chair of strategic communications at the Marine Corps University in Quantico. The chair is sponsored by the Marine Corps University Foundation. So when I say sponsored by, that means that they're getting the funds to bring them down to the Marine Corps to teach our Marines about strategic communication, information operation, and all of these powerful things, all these powerful tools that are being used today. He has a background in public diplomacy. He was a public diplomacy officer in the Foreign Service. If anybody remembers, if you're old enough to remember the U.S. Information Agency, he was part of that, and then he went over to the State Department um, for 31 years. He attained the rank of Minister Counselor in the Career Service. I won't read the rest of his bio, but if you have one of these right here, you will see it's a very, very esteemed bio, and he's a very, very esteemed man. We appreciate having him here today to share his knowledge about kind of dime and all the other kind of pieces and really kind of give some background on this. So please enjoy, and we'll hold questions to the end. Okay, thank you. Don, please. I'd have, I'd have driven a few more miles uh, to, hear that, to hear that introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donald Bishop uh, from Marine Corps University. You've heard in Quantico. Uh, the Marine Corps concentrates all its uh, in-residence professional military education in Quantico. Uh, and, uh, and then perhaps many of you have, have driven south on I-95 and you've noticed the spire of the, of the National Museum of the Marine Corps. If you haven't stopped, do so. You will not be disappointed. It is a sensational museum. Okay, now, our subject today, dime reshuffled I-card high. We all know the DIME framework, and it's an acronym for Elements of, uh, Internet, of, of National Power. Uh, but um, the uh, uh, but I'm I'm saying that the uh, the contours of that whole dime construct are changing with the rise of informational power. Now, uh, those of you who really follow military thinking will know that uh, dime is a little bit of an old-fashioned term. Uh, now, some people go for dime fill. They've added some elements like F for financial or PAMISI. Uh, that had currency for a while. Now, uh, there's midfield, and it's got M-I, it's got M-E-I and D in there. But today, let's just go with the dime, which is the sort of the original anchor principle. Now, suppose we were thinking of uh, elements of uh, national power in terms of cards dealt to you. So, yes, we've got our hand. We've got four of the cards in our hand. Diplomatic, information, informational, uh, military, and economic. Uh, now, if they're laid on the table, here is the U.S. hand. So, our military power is unmatched in the world. And, uh, and so I, it's always our ace. Uh, our economic power uh, is, is we, have, we have the largest economy, uh, and so and tremendous uh, energy in our, in our economy, so perhaps that's our king. And uh, I, I'm retired from the Foreign Service. I think our diplomats are pretty good. And uh, so that is perhaps our, our jack for diplomatic uh, power. But uh, you notice our I card information I'm rating is a four. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, this is just to introduce the, the different uh, parts of this, uh, this dime, these elements of dime for our own country. And if we look at the uh, elements for Russia, Start on the right. Uh, well, they have so they have some military power, and uh, maybe we can give them a ten. Uh, their natural resources uh, for their E card, their economic card, 
Uh, that gives them, a, you know, gives them a jack. Uh, they have very strong diplomacy. Uh, very professional diplomats who stay in country for decades. And so uh, perhaps we give them a queen for their uh, diplomatic power. But what's noticeable uh, is in our decade, uh, the, their, I card, their high card is the I card, the informational card. And so uh, in general, we can say that uh, in the last decade and in the next, the hands, the cards are being reshuffled and the hands are being redealt. And I'm saying that the I card uh, is moving higher and may soon be the, the most prominent. Now, for today's discussion, here's where I plan to go. Uh, first, to put us on the same pages, let's look first at four frames that I teach my students at Marine Corps University. Uh, then, let's talk about the shift in the calcul in this, uh, calculations of power with uh, looking at the, the in informational instrument of power. Then, we'll go to issues that need to be resolved for a way forward in this new environment. And then let's revisit uh, some evergreen topics, self-understanding, ideals, and appeals. Okay, so we're in, now we're into the frames. Okay, the first frame, I think what everybody knows here, uh, the, different, uh, the different definitions of power, categorizations of power, hard power, soft power, sh smart power, sharp power. Of course, hard power is military force, show of force, threat of force, use of force, but it can also include uh, economic sanctions and, uh, and occasionally subversive diplomacy. On the right, on top, we have, of course, soft power, a term that's been around since the early 90s, uh, thanks, to the, thanks to Joseph Nye. Uh, and soft power is the power of a country to attract, uh, to attract other people to admire uh, and so they, they perhaps admired the prosperity, the government, the way of life, and certainly soft power was a very important element of U.S. national power during the Cold War. Now, uh, smart power on the lower left uh, is the intelligent combination of all forms of power. So it includes diplomacy, public diplomacy, development, assistance, a whole lot of arrays and soft power, heavy increments of soft power. And so uh, I'm good, with, I'm certainly good with smart power. Again, the intelligent combination of all the instruments that a nation has. And then we have sharp power, which has been uh, around as a term since I think 2017, the National Endowments uh, Report uh, sort of put it on the front table. So this is the power to. Uh, use the social media or means of communications to pierce or penetrate or perforate another society uh, and, uh, and to uh, stir things up. Okay, so that's the first frame. Okay, the second frame I take students through is U.S. informational power. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, now, I'm not sure that if I were going to show Koreans a single movie about the United States that I would choose The Godfather. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, you know, it's one of the great movies. Uh, Titanic, you know, it's, it's uh, boy, people all around the world watch that and, uh, and, and had some interesting uh, conclusions from it. But the, th the point about U.S. informational power at this point in our talk is that it all doesn't belong to Uncle Sam. Uh, so, of course, when we, when we talk about different parts of our informational power, we have the, the newspapers, the, the wire, what we used to call the wires, but are now information companies. We have the television networks. Those networks have agreements with networks all over the world that they can use clips uh, and news reports. And, of course, uh, our universities are an enormous source of our uh, of our informational power. I think that there are more than a million students from other countries who are studying in the United States and they have to have some kind of influence. And continuing through this, uh, this informational power that doesn't belong to Uncle Sam, 
the fact that uh, the content on, on the internet is uh, largely uh, comes from the United States more than other countries. That's uh, that's part of our soft power. The fact that American English is English is the global language, but uh, it's um, it's American English uh, that is the has, is becoming the standard. And there are tens of thousands of Americans teaching English uh, around the world. And you know, there's there are a lot of things. Our museums they set the pace for the world's museums. They show how to display things. They show how to organize exhibits that focus on themes. And these are followed by museums all over the world. Uh, the foundations are, are out in the world in a very big way, and so are our businesses. Uh, Ogilvy, a public relations firm, the, all our public relations firms, international public relations firms, are out in the world. Uh, world Vision here, just one uh, representative NGO that uh, works in many countries. And uh, Congress endows uh, three endowments, but they say the National Endowment for Democracy uh, also has, uh, has, has many programs around the world with good impacts. And of course, Hollywood. Well, Hollywood. <laughs> now, um, we can pause for a moment here. Hollywood provides a good example of informational power, informational influence that's not controlled by Uncle Sam. Uh, and it exports images and ideas about the United States. Uh, now, some of those images are, I think, not very helpful, like uh, out of control cops, rogue CIA agents. Businesses that trash the environment. And uh, as we can see here, that America is a gun-obsessed society. Uh, when Americans watch these movies, we can put this all in context. We can understand, oh, okay, they're, they're, you know, we, we know that it's, uh, that it's entertainment. But people who see these movies overseas uh, often don't have that background knowledge. And so uh, Hollywood does export uh, visions of the United States. But we shouldn't be too we shouldn't be too critical of Hollywood. Um, now, if I could choose films for foreigners to see uh, about the United States, I'd choose uh, Saving Private Ryan, or I'd choose uh, Midway, or To Kill a Mockingbird, or either of the two Mister Rogers movies. These are the images I'd like foreigners to absorb about the United States. Um, and I would not have been likely to choose Hollywood Cop. But uh, the columnist uh, here in National View, a boy in the Soviet Union, got his first taste of American movies, and it was Eddie Murphy that excited him, that taught him how free Americans were. And, uh, and he and his pals, you know, they started saying, uh, hasta la vista, baby. And will the force be with you? These are these are these are messages communicated across the world by our by our uh, by Hollywood. And if you occasionally give in to the notion that um, oh the days of American soft power are past, you know it's not like it used to be. Uh, then uh, there are still places where our ideals have the power to attract. Now. This is Hong Kong during their demonstrations. Uh, I think that I, I'm expecting that when I go to the White House, you know, they will have blown this photo up, you know, uh, eight feet tall and, and across. I mean, you got the American flag. So an inspiration in Hong Kong coming from our package of ideals, and then for bonus, make America great again. In which with the hat, that's uh, anyway, it's, it's quite a quite the photograph. Okay, so that's frame two. Frame three is about Uncle Sam's instruments of informational power. And I count them as four, public affairs, public, uh, public diplomacy, international broadcasting, and operations in the, international, in the information environment. So let's take a look at these briefly one by one. Now, public affairs, um, we all remember uh, the daily briefings, the White House briefing, the State Department briefing, the Defense Department briefing, and I guarantee you 
virtually every television station in the world had at least 30 seconds of one of those briefings every day around the world. So these were important gateways for the transmission of administration uh, positions. Uh, now, of course, uh, the Trump administration has decided on a kind of a new modality, and it's largely uh, with, uh, the, with the president as the, as the representative and spokesman. I would say uh, that over the years, the U.S. image has become personalized. Uh, it, it was personal, and this is not, not just beginning of the, with the Trump administration, but the Clinton administration, you know, the, he, the President Clinton was in the news every day, and then President Bush and President Obama. Uh, but it's become particularly conspicuous now. Uh, I'll just simply say it has pluses and minuses. And, uh, or I can say perhaps that the MSNBC and Fox report and you decide. Okay, public diplomacy, that's the activities that the State Department oversees. Uh, of course, they, this is what I did for many years. Uh, uh, the public affairs section of an embassy overseas handles the public affairs for embassies and consulates, but it runs a large array of exchange programs, uh, certainly the Fulbright program, sending American scholars out, bringing foreign scholars in. Uh, the International Visitor Leadership Program, which is identifying rising movers and shakers in society and giving them a chance to visit the United States, and then other programs to, uh, to promote American English. Uh, a new tool in the public diplomacy uh, family is the Global Engagement Center. And uh, that's a big bunch of words, direct, lead, synchronize, integrate, coordinate. Uh, expose, understand, expose, counter foreign state and foreign non-state propaganda and disinformation efforts. Now, in general, uh, they have been playing their cards close to the chest about what they do, but uh, there's a brand new report come out from GWU, which I recommend, uh, uh, for Sater Parish, and from page six, it has many pages about uh, what the Global Engagement Center is doing. So I, I recommend that if you're curious about the State Department's efforts, uh, take a look at that. Okay, so we talked about public affairs, we talked about public diplomacy. Now we can talk, let's talk about international broadcasting. It, you, the, the, the Uncle Sam's overseas broadcasting networks used to belong to the Broadcasting Board of Governors, but now they belong to the U.S. Agency for Global Media. And of course here are the here are the networks, the Voice of America is the flagship, uh, Radio Free Asia to Asia, Radio Free Europe, Play Radio Liberty, as far out as Afghanistan, uh, uh, Middle East Broadcasting Networks, two of them, Al Hura and Radio Saba Marquis for Cuba. And it's interesting, um, under Radio Free Asia, there's a new broadcast service called Benar News, which focuses on, um, well, the Rohingyas, in uh, Burma, and of course, as many of whom have fled to Bangladesh, but they're broadcasting Bengali and uh, uh, Bahasa, and so languages for South uh, for Southeast Asia. Uh, if we just look at the list of um, at the list of languages for the Voice, there are 71 languages with all all those broadcasters total. But uh, for instance, uh, broadcasting in Korean, we are not broadcasting for South Korea. They are saturated with their own broadcasts, but we're broadcasting for North Korea. Uh, Tibetan, uh, we're not broadcasting 24-7 uh, to Tibet, but uh, there are a few hours each day. And uh, you'll notice some languages, I had to look in the, I had to, I had to check out, consult Google, where is Kinyarwanda spoken? Uh, but it, it, several of these African languages are in the, in what we used to talk about, the ungoverned space in the Sahel, so at least a broadcast uh, into those areas. Okay, now so we have so now then we have our our fourth, which is uh, used to be called information operations, and it's still a term of doctrine. Uh, operations in the information environment seems to be uh, catching on, although I, I'm not sure there's been a, a definite definition of it. 
but that includes several things, counter network defense, electronic warfare, operational security, cyberspace operations. Uh, I call this the electron side, uh, but then uh, uh, PSYOP, psychological operations, or military information support operations uh, is part of it. And then deception. Now, the word, de the word deception in this uh, particular military subspecialty uh, gives foreign service officers uh, the shakes. Uh, and, but at any rate, it's there. Uh, PSYOP in the old days was, you know, loudspeakers and leaflets and radio, television publications, face-to-face -face communications, Kelly, key leader engagements. Um, but it is upping its game in the, uh, in the age of the social media. And I just have to mention that uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, there, the concept is evolving so that it, it takes those I.O. disciplines, but it adds civil affairs and it adds comstrat, communications uh, strategy. Okay, now, all that said, these four different instruments of U.S. informational power that belong to Uncle Sam, uh, here's what the national security strategy had to say. U.S. efforts to counter the exploitation by rivals have been tepid and fragmented, uh, and it's still the case. So if we're honest, we admit that the people involved in all of these instruments of uh, informational power, that they are Olympic swimmers, but they're in a swimming pool of molasses. Uh, so there are silos, clusters, confusion, uh, people in one lane don't necessarily know what others are doing. Um, so lanes, firewalls, sources of funding, doctrines. And all of this at a time when there are severe challenges to U.S. leadership and the, and the inter, international order. And I just give, offer just one example. I was in Afghanistan at the embassy in 09-10. Uh, and at that time, there were a lot of broadcasting going on in Afghanistan. Uh, so the voice of America uh, was heard and was indeed re relayed by uh, radio television in Afghanistan. Uh, the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, this is broadcasting in Pashto and Dari, uh, was there. Uh, USAID had set up a small network of stations across the northern part of, uh, of Afghanistan. They called it the Salam Watandar Network. So combined joint psychological operations task force. This was the Germans. This was NATO radio. They had a network in the middle of Afghanistan. Uh, combined joint special operations task force. They had another network. And then you had battalions with radios in a box. Uh, there was no sharing, no coordination. Um, it was, I mean, I was, just, I was just surprised. So radio could be an important uh, instrument, uh, important medium for the communication into Afghan villages and different regions of the country, but uh, there wasn't much going on. Okay, now, frame four, and we will use a little bit of time on this. It's to distinguish between what I call information and cyber, which is so much in the news, or hacking, so, okay, cyber. It is communication between microprocessors. You can interrupt it, intercept it, extract, corrupt, block, but it's, it's electrons moving between microprocessors. And while cyber and information now overlap, they're separate disciplines. There's the electrons and then there's the ideas. Our confusion may come from the, the fact that we, when we talk about information, often the next word is Technology, information technology. We say, oh, IT, information, IT. Ah, that means computers. Ah, that means cyber. So we, we sort of join these two words in a way that, that I think is not helpful. And we need to be more careful in our discussion. So, cyber is communication between microprocessors and these digital methods allow for quicker attacks over larger distances, uh, enable intelligence gathering, possibly provide the ability to disable military civilian 
weapon systems, infrastructure, and enhanced deception. Okay, and, and that is a substantial big challenge. It's a challenge of today and tomorrow. So we are rightly putting a lot of effort into, into the cyber, and we have commands for cyber. Um, but information is what moves on the networks. Uh, it's not the electrons, it's the ideas, it's the knowledge, it's the facts, it's the data. But also, it's logic and argument and education, theory, beliefs, judgment, interpretation, all these things. And, of course, truth. I guess we can give that some visibility here. So, uh, that's the information side of this, of this challenge, and the one that interests me most. Now, we all know that weaponized informational measures can do a lot of things. They can confuse and delay planning and response, induce hesitation. They can delegitimize leadership, weaken the cohesion of units and commands, and disrupt support from home. So, it's not enough to have the cyber. You have to have the information, the ideas as well. And it takes information to counter falsehood, disinformation, propaganda, conjecture, and replace them all with facts. And it's information that has to offer visions for partnership and governance and coalitions and alliance. Why is it that we should join you? Uh, it's to demonstrate mutuality. If there's anything I know from, from diplomacy, from go and give in demarches at the foreign ministry, you know, I can, they can give me that instruction from Washington and I can deliver it to the foreign minister. But I need to be able to say, well, you know, I appeal to you to agree, to cooperate. It's good for us, but it's good for you too. Now, sometimes it's good for us today and it's good for you way down the road. But still, if you can't demonstrate mutuality, uh, it's, a, it's a hard row in diplomacy. So the, at any rate, that's, it takes information to do that and to inspire confidence. And so I ask a question for whether it's for the civilian organizations that are engaged in cyber or whether it's cyber command. Uh, have we got both cyber and information people working together? Are the cyber and STEM warriors mixed in with the history, humanities, culture, area studies, language fighters? Now, I was so pleased to see this article. The Army, Army Cyber School now teaches information operations. I, I, I want to learn more about this. I hope it's a sign of the future. Okay, so we have the four frames, just to warm up. Hard, soft. Smart, sharp power, forms of uh, information power, instrument, informational instruments of Uncle Sam, and how we're fragmented. And then we talked about cyber and information. So now, let me talk about why informational power, which was once thought of as an afterthought, something to be sprinkled onto policy. Uh, oh, we'll think of the policy now. You all think of you know persuading people to adopt it. Uh, how that's becoming more necessary and even critical. So first, adversaries want to avoid U.S. military response. Uh, who wants to go to war with the United States? Uh, there's, a, there's a phase construct that military people use, phase zero shaping. Um, phase three is when, you, it's what, when the kinetic war starts. But uh, G General Dunford has talked about our, our adversaries continuously operate at phase 2.5. They're trying to just, you know, assert their, assert themselves, but without, without crossing a boundary that would, uh, that would uh, provoke a U.S. military response. And then there's now, in the age of social media, uh, lies, uh, the, the, the old fact that lies sprint, the truth walks, it uh, you know takes on new. So it, 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 they sprint at higher speeds. The falsehoods uh, and responses are very slow. Uh, so easy to put on the you know there was a, there were civilian casualties in Iraq or Afghanistan. The response well we said I have to send out an investigation team. 
interview people, that's that's a very slow response, and it can it can uh, and and it's sometimes too late to counteract the falsehoods, and they're cheap to launch. Okay, so now, now some of the some of the current phenomena that we can see, disinformation, fake news, uh, Photoshop deep fakes, trolls and bots, troll swarms, propaganda, conspiracy theories. Um, these are all disruptive, and so they, in, in their different ways, they challenge facts and truth, and then they weaken confidence in democratic government, they erode trust and resolve in social cohesion. And whether it's more or whether it's less, uh, they're part of the polarization of, of our country. Maybe more, maybe less, but it's there. We can spend an hour, you know, giving examples here, just a few snapshots. Um, the, uh, there's the Photoshop level. Uh, can you see the Ukrainian tank in the lower left? Actually, that, that, what, the photograph had been taken a few years before the new news story that you see has got the swastika so, uh, painted on the, or photoshopped onto the tank. So that's the message, oh, the Ukrainians are Nazis. Um, Let's see, of course we have uh, very busy people at RT and at Sputnik. And it's interesting that their mottos tell you a lot about what they do. So if you can see on the wall in RT, question more. Oh, I mean if we use an old example, President Kennedy killed by G Lee Harvey Oswald? Oh, we have to ask question more. Or maybe there was the grassy knoll. Maybe it was the mafia. Maybe it was so. It's that carried forward into yeah, into our own times and telling the untold. Well, NATO did an investigation and they told their story. Let me tell you the real story, the untold story. So it uh, it's the fire hose of falsehoods. And we can't forget that uh, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea are all using their informational power to disrupt the international system and weaken our leadership while they control their own domestic opinion. Um, so of course on the lower right we all know the Great Firewall of China that's keeping information from the world out. Uh, on the upper right these are antennas from uh, jamming Voice of America broadcast during the Cold War but North Korea still jams. Uh, and of course uh, there was that interesting photograph of the two Chinese librarians uh, burning uh, old books that were no longer deemed suitable for, uh, for circulation. Okay, How do, what do we do about this? What are some of the ways forward, issues to resolve? First, we have these four instruments. They have different lanes. For instance, State Department public policy is overseas. Uh, somebody else should be doing opinion in the United States. Uh, authorities. Uh, I was astounded in uh, Afghanistan when an Army public affairs officer came up and said, well, you know, our legal authority is only to inform. It doesn't include persuade. And uh, I was, anyway, I was surprised. And because in the State Department, we, we know that while we inform, we also help persuade. But anyway, the, these are authorities, firewalls, uh, the, uh, the broadcasters prize their journalistic independence, um, operations in the information environment includes deception, that uh, one of the sub-disciplines uh, sub, uh, that others fear. Uh, so resolving all this is necessary. Now, it's easy for me to say that. I mean, the laws, the legislation, the doctrines, the manuals, the joint. Uh, this, is, this is really hard, but somebody has to tackle it or we're going to continue to be uh, divided in our efforts. I tried to tackle some of this in a Strategy Bridge article that I recommend to all of you. Um, time to align the instruments of informational power. I think the best that can be hoped for is that, the, that these instruments get aligned. They know what each other do. They kind of pull in the same direction because I'm pessimistic about 
the ability of there to be a great legislative resolution of all these, uh, all these different issues that I talked about. Uh, often, people say, well, we just need to uh, reinvent the, uh, reinstate the U.S. Information Agency. And uh, as an alumnus of the U.S. Information Agency, I'm, I'm real pleased uh, to hear the respect uh, for us. Uh, but Matt Armstrong, I think, uh, you, can, you can find the article on the net, he, uh, he's, he, he says not only it's not needed, but it's not going to happen in various ways. But then I read, okay, USA, USA needs a lead facilitator. No, not, it's not a czar, but a facilitator. Uh, so at any rate, so this, this is an issue that uh, is still alive. But short of a major unification, uh, and, uh, and or to do things ahead of the resolution of a long public policy debate, it's possible to do some low-hanging fruit. The public affairs, public policy, broadcasting, and information operations folks um, need to educate one another in their schoolhouses. Uh, I find that uh, uh, a few years ago, I went to the Pence Information School that trains Armed Forces Public Affairs Officer, of which I'm also an alumnus, and, uh, and they weren't teaching much about what embassies do in public affairs or how you can use the embassy on a deployment. They're doing that now, but uh, that's an example of the kind of thing that needs to be done. Uh, all the exercises, simulations, war games that go on uh, need role players from all the informational communities. Uh, there need to be exchange tours uh, between the disciplines. Public affairs officers do some public uh, diplomacy. The broadcasters go out to em an embassy, whatever. And uh, it might surprise you, but at embassies, there are a lot of there are a lot of sections of an embassy that have information awareness, education, and exchange programs, but they don't talk to one another. Uh, DEA has money. Uh, agriculture has money. Um, uh, law enforcement has money. So, uh, but that they're often distant, or they're not very well informed by the public. The public affairs officers don't have a good idea of what's going on. Okay, and here's an interesting case study. In 2000, um, the Brits uh, intervened in Sierra Leone. It's called Operation Palliser. Now there was a hostage rescue part of it, there was humanitarian intervention, there was end to the Civil War. Uh, but in this, as, as the Brits came in, there was a, a, quite a diverse array of communication needs. Uh, they needed to reach Sierra Leoneans in cities and in villages. They needed to uh, communicate with different warring bands. They, there were displaced persons all wandering all across the country. There are seven languages being spoken. Uh, so the military information operators couldn't do all of that, and the embassy couldn't do all of that. But the lesson was you put the information operators and the public diplomacy people in one room, and they work things out. They use what they have. Uh, each uses what they have to help solve the problem. Okay, another, uh, another thing that needs to be integrated into a large uh, American response is to understand the party states. I don't need to talk about this a long time, but uh, in the case of China, North Korea, um, and Vietnam, we still have Communist Party states. Uh, this is a, up on the top top tour, that's, that's in the Great Hall of the People. I have been in that room. And one week, when it's got the hammer and sickle, it's the party having its Congress. And then three weeks later, it's got the state seal, so it's the National People's Congress that meets. Okay, so how this, uh, how this works out, both state and party structures are part of their growing information assertiveness. So this needs to be, this needs to be part of what's done. Getting religion right. The world is a religious place, and uh, we have our concept of separation of church and state, and we know, we, and, it's, and it's balanced with free exercise, uh, so we work it out among ourselves. But uh, I've, in my own experience, foreign service people, for instance, are a little reluctant to talk about religion, thinking they'll somehow say something that's not proper. Um, 
so their the separation has become a you know as sort of the dominant theme they think of. I was cheered by a State Department publication just maybe two months published two months ago. You might take a look at for and download. Uh, it's faith and freedom religion in the USA. Uh, it's been it's been published in five languages so far. It's on the web in five languages here Chinese and Arabic. So. Uh, it's a step in the getting religion right. There's a lot that needs to be thought through about the role of religion in societies and how uh, and how, how we respond to it. Okay, now the communicators often talk about um, white, gray, and black communications. Uh, so white is, this is the voice of America, and here is the news. It's attributed, and it's true. Uh, uh, there are other broadcasts or other papers uh, that are black. They're false information and false uh, attribution. And then gray is a mix of them, too. Now, um, from time to time, I've heard people, as they're thinking through the informational uh, issues, they say, hmm, well, our adversaries use black propaganda, and they falsely attribute things and so on. Maybe we have to think about that, too. Now, I say, no, Uncle Sam's uh, communication should always be quite truthful and attributed. But it's an idea that needs to be talked through, and it needs to be put into doctrines. And um, uh, for instance, one problem is that some of our messages, we are probably not the best person to place that, to speak on behalf of that issue in a foreign society. We may not have credibility. So, uh, perhaps we're hoping that there might be a partner that does it. So at any rate, this all needs to be thought through. The cognitive dimension, culture and the cognitive dimension. This is a slide from the Center for Advanced Operational Cultural Learning. If you're going to really be communicating to foreign societies, you need to know a lot. And now, we, we don't even need to go through this. Um, Communicating is more than just translation. It's shaping or fitting a message in ways that will best resonate in a foreign society. You've got to know a lot uh, to be able to do that well. Let's see. Let's skip a couple slides here. Okay, area studies and cultural knowledge. I believe that we as a nation are, are deficient. Uh, we need more students and we need more people overseas uh, in, society, in foreign societies, uh, learning the languages but also learning the culture. So look at Chinese students in the United States, 363,000. Who can imagine? Uh, U.S. students in, that, in China, maybe 12,000. And that includes students who go on little three-week excursions. You know, they get, a, they get an hour of credit for the three-week excursion. So, uh, and that hardly begins <clears throat> to acquaint uh, somebody with, uh, with China. Uh, I think we probably need to subsidize uh, more young Americans out, it, out in the world learning languages and learning cultures. Now, I believe we should also, we need to be thinking, understanding the principles and methods of political warfare. Now, a certain well-known scholar here at uh, IWP, is did a very handy list, uh, not exhaustive perhaps, but like rumors and character assassination, all kinds of things going on. But um, it's not that we want to engage in these political warfare practices in my book, but that we are going to see this happening to us. And so we need to know the theory of political warfare and, uh, and the history of political warfare to be able to to be able to uh, confront, and may I say, totally unsolicited, <laughs> this is a great book that touches that touches on that touches on some of this, and um, and it's uh, people in the State Department need to be reading it. Okay, one yet one more thing that needs to be done: the diaspora factor. I haven't seen anybody really studying this. But take Somalis. Where do most Somalis live? Anyway, in the United States, Minneapolis and Portland, Maine. Uh, they want. They listen to the voice of America. They listen to the voice of America in 
in Somalia, they want to listen to the voice of America in Minneapolis. Uh, and then there are other places. Uh, Koreans are, you know, there's a huge diaspora, and they're constantly communicating with people back in the country. And, uh, and so there's this inner flow between societies, between cultures here, diasporas here, and then the homeland. And uh, this is something that somehow needs to be wrapped into a comprehensive, um, a comprehensive approach to informational uh, power. Okay, now, education, resilience, civil defense. So here, what you say, fund students in Ukraine to learn how to spot fake stories, propaganda, and hate speech. Okay, I'm good with it. But my first question is, who's funding American students? Who's focusing American students on how to spot fake stories and so on? Now, uh, there are people who are focused on this. Go to the Propaganda Critic website. Propagandacritic.com, I think it's a fabulous website. It's very interesting, they are, they're starting with this old Institute for Propaganda Analysis from 1937 to 1942, which identified techniques of propaganda, sort of the ABCs of techniques. They're list name calling, glittering generalities, euphemisms. Uh, when I was a junior high school student, I, somebody, somebody gave us a couple days of this. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be current now. But, the, but there needs to be a lot more. And there are a lot of efforts going on to do this, but they're kind of piecemeal. So here, Office of the West Virginia Secretary of State. Good for West Virginia. Uh, a, a very nice PowerPoint on Russia's campaign to influence uh, U.S. elections. EBSCO. You know, they're an academic uh, publisher. Spotting fake news and images on the web, first slide of their PowerPoint. And of course, you can teach these things, uh, you can teach about fakes by using fakes. How about this one? From a school in Oregon. Anybody seen this before? Okay, well, it's waiting, it's waiting there. The Pacific Wingless Tree Octopus, oh man. <laughs> Somebody, some, some genius had some time. <laughs> okay, and then, and then, and then, if we're going to talk about information, information, American views in the world, we need to understand ourselves. We need to understand our ideas and appeals. Now, master and commander, who saw it? Okay, a good, a good sprinkling. I recommend it to everybody. Ah, Russell Crowe, he's great. Napoleonic British sea captain. <laughs> anyway, so at, at, at one point in the movie, he's drilling the, gu the gun crews, you know, with the cannon. And uh, he wants them to be able to, you know, to drill, you know, fire, a uh, high rate of fire. So he's got his stopwatch and he's, you know, timing the guns and start again. I mean, and so he, he decides to stir up the, stir up the, the sailors. He says, you want to see a guillotine in Piccadilly? No. You want to call that raggedy ass Napoleon your king? No. You want your children to sing La Marseillaise? No. Okay, now, I, I thought about that scene a lot. He's talking about form of government, constitutional monarchy against, uh, you know, he's using these sort of home, homely examples, uh, language and culture. And so on. And so I really learned more about the Napoleonic Wars from that two minutes uh, than I than I did from a lot of uh, studies, battle studies. So that's an example from the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, we got plenty of our own examples, and uh, I know this is old-fashioned stuff, but I'm really a believer in kind of honing around on the four freedoms. Now. Uh, they need updating. They creak a little bit. Norman Rockwell is a little bit overexposed, uh, but these are important. And what they're, what I like about them is they're carrying your backpack things. Only got a list of four things. Boy, we believe in freedom of religion, and we believe in freedom of speech. And I wrote an article on this. So please, as you leave, take away a copy of the magazine. Um, I'm keen on the four freedoms. And I discovered, much, much to my surprise, that General Mattis, or Secretary Mattis, is quite keen on them also. I never once saw human beings flee freedom of speech. 
I never saw families on the run from religion. I never picked anybody out of a raft in the ocean desperate to escape a free press. Okay, General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, this is, you know, your lifetime of reading, which bridges both military and then philosophy and American history and so on. Uh, he understands this. Carry in your backpack. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the United States put a lot of effort into the formation of the United Nations Economic, Social, Cultural Organization. And this is the beginning. Wars begin in the minds of men. It's in the minds of men that the defense of peace must be constructed. It's very interesting. In that preamble, the four freedoms are in there. Uh, it made a worldwide UN document. Okay. All that's fine, but there may be a good chance the substantive issues of information warfare will not be addressed until the United States is actually engaged in an information war. So that deal, that's a reality check on, uh, on everything that I've spoken about. Um, I, uh, I was inspired by Benjamin Franklin and his, uh, remember that old cartoon where they got the snake that's chopped up and, uh, you know, it's New England, Pennsylvania, and you got to join or die. So I decided if it was good for Ben, it was good for me. I am dying, join or die. <laughs> Okay, so public affairs, public diplomacy, Agency for Global Media, Voice of America, Operations of the Information, PSYOP, Cyber. And of course, what's the head? Common sense. So there's a little homage there to Tom Paine and his ideals during the revolution. Okay, thank you so much. I'm ready for any questions. <laughs> What questions do we have, Mr. Bishop? My name is John Dix. I have a sort of a question from a political consultant's perspective. You uh, mentioned the white, gray, and black yeah. communications and, and how Uncle Sam should always be you know, the white side. Yep. Is there any place in the private sector for you know civilian public affairs? organizations or, or LLCs and that kind of thing, yep. which we have plenty of, right. to contract aspects of communication, even if that was in oh. the gray area. Well, I don't have any problem with contracting, having people do the work, uh, do, do the designs, make the videos, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, not, not a screenplay, but script uh, a video presentation. But uh, it's sort of like in the political campaigns. You know, this message, what do you buy? Mike Bloomberg for president. Yeah. You know, I want that. I want that attribution, or it, uh, and not to be not to be hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it be, again, this is something that a nice round table of people I think would need to talk through. But uh, but uh, and who knows? There might be some exceptions in cer certain circumstances. But on the whole, if you ask me, I, I want white. I want attributed and true. Uh, now, what's true? You know, sometimes you uh, something edges over into propaganda when an element of falsehood is introduced into into something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm dead against introducing falsehoods into any uh, any, any message. But uh, maybe if you tell part of the story, or maybe you spin it, you know, to put it in its most favorable light, I'm a little less alarmed by that because I think at least among Americans, we're fairly savvy about those things. I mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, maybe an example would be in the social media sphere yes. and influencers and stuff like yeah. that. So if the United States oh. has interests in South Africa yeah. and you know puts things on social media and they want people to like it, right. people to be seen liking it, yeah. that sort of thing. So I think that I think that, that uh, and that partly it may uh, allude to the question or what I mentioned before that sometimes Uncle Sam is not the best. Right. You know, uh, uh, person uh, to uh, to promote a message, and again, I'd like to you know I'd like to see somebody sit down and re develop a doctrine in this area. 
I, I say that I'm I'm all for white, uh, and how we might encourage uh, other partners in other countries to do some of the speaking. For instance, the State Department uh, in the early uh, war on terrorism, you know, efforts by the uh, by, for the Global Engagement Center, we worked out agreements with uh, the UAE and Egypt. To, for us to cooperate on uh, anti-terrorist messaging. So, and I, I don't have all the details on, uh, you know, what, how, how those were labeled, but there's there's some room there, I'd say, to discuss it, but uh, I have a disposition for fight. Just ask me. Yes? Um, first, let me thank you for just an excellent presentation. I appreciate your Nice publicity. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you, as you know, the uh, U.S. military will give power to lower-ranking officers to engage in diplomatic negotiations with village elders or tribal leaders when they are uh, deployed on the ground giving them an enormous amount of discretion, yes. investing in an enormous amount of trust in their judgment. But there seems to be very little capacity to do this when it comes to giving trust to a large number of participants in any type of public affairs or public diplomacy information uh, dissemination because of the desirability of centralized message control. Yes. Is there any way of overcoming this as a practical matter? Okay, so I think you've stated it pretty well. And one reason for the that it helps explain the extreme sensitivity of a hierarchical organization like the State Department or formal DOD public affairs is that so, you can you can say something that is understood in context, but then when it gets back to the U.S. Somebody says that word, you know, or so there, there are so many people ready to roar about uh, a mistake in communication, the selection of a, of a sharp word instead of a moderate word, uh, a partisan word instead of a, a, a so that, that explains, I think, this, this sensitivity. Uh, the, as, I, in principle, like the idea of uh, well, in the military, you have strategic corporals, and the idea is that corporal is supposed, if he knows the, the general objectives, understands the commander's intent, then they can operate. And I, I'd like to see some serious thinking about how to take that kind of uh, idea and extend the trust down, down farther, uh, because it, if you have the 50 cent army in China, or you have all the thousands of employees of the Internet Research Agency in Russia who are just on the keyboard all the time and can say anything they want. And then we're waiting, you know, for the State Department briefing to give the absolutely blessed words, which are too late. Uh, we need a way to be faster. And part of that should be trust farther down. But this is a, uh, so I have that sort of idea, but you know, this is, you got to have the big brains and the people with equities sit down and hammer it out. So when I, that slide I said about lanes and firewalls and funding and so on, that's part of that discussion that needs to take place. And I'm not sure that, that, that there is a table that all these people sit at. Uh, broadcasters won't want to sit with public diplomacy people, but you know, how that's done, uh, anyway, that's my tentative thoughts. John, how, where do you see deception operations falling? I, mean, I know military has used no. deception operations oftentimes, yeah. but where do you see that falling into, into today's kind of strategic kind of planning of where we go with this? Yeah. So, I'm stepping way out on a limb here, <laughs> and I'm not an expert in deception. Um, I think that American journalists who are embedded with units or are out in command headquarters in theaters, uh, if they learn that deception is coming up, I think that they, on their own, say, this is not the story for today. I don't want to do anything that would. 
uh, endanger our, our soldiers. Um, so, uh, and many of the things that the I.O. people do are very, very focused on a small area, a town that's being attacked. Okay, we'll leaflet it, we'll message it loudspeakers, and maybe there'll be deception involved in that. And it, if, it's, if it's so limited by, you know, geography, then I think that, and it's a military operation, uh, at, then there's a carve out there in my mind. And, and, but it needs to be in doctrine. It needs, to, and the military people need to have thought through uh, these circumstances, and it needs to be taught in the schoolhouses. You know, well, okay, deception, this, but you gotta, anyway, public affairs officer needs to know, uh, and so on. So that's, that's sort of a, that's just a hazy, hazy glimpse, or a glimpse into the haze on that. John, I would just, I would just, uh, add, oh, yes. I would just add that. Uh, based on my experience, is that deception is a little bit different. That's a little bit unique. That, that's a little bit separate from just yep. information operations. I think when you come in, we talk about military deception, uh, I think the, the senior officers know very strictly what tools they can use. Mm -hmm. The press is not one of those tools. Oh, uh, no. if, you, if you remember uh, Fallujah, uh, when there was a briefing given by a flight officer, and he, he mentioned a date in which we thought the assault was going to take place, and it was an incorrect date, and he was accused later on of deceiving, of using, using, mm -hmm. using the press to, uh, to intentionally de deceive. That was not the case. It was simply a uh, clip that was misspoken. So I, I think I think deception, usually highly classified, the tools that are used for, for military deception are, are controlled and understood by those who employ them, what can be done. And I think the public affairs officer, for instance, is carefully screened for any deception operations, and so, as, is, as is the press. And so I would say that uh those sort of safeguards or guidelines or you know, all that is something that needs to be in a little wider in the literature so that the so that the uh, broadcasters know so that the public affairs public diplomacy people know and that's something that is probably not best done out there in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever it's something that needs to have been integrated into uh, integrated into training or the schoolhouses so we're, we have, we have yeah, overlap. Yeah, we, we've got yeah. You had a question? Oh, yes, yeah. um, I wanted to ask about, um, about if there's enough, uh, or is there much research so far into uh, institutions versus individuals who make for really effective information operations? Is there, you know, I mean, I'm imagining this maybe from the view of a targeting officer looking at, you know, some local Taliban warlord doing his version or deception or in Syria or something. Is there something like where you have a very effective enemy and you can figure, oh, if, I, if we just take them out, then the, oh. they control so much of the information that the whole thing, the whole operation will be less effective in the future. Or is it really like this is an institutional ground level, well, maybe not grassroots, an astroturfing, you know, very effective astroturfing. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I think I'm probably not the right person to ask that question. I would say, though, that uh, so for your your average diplomat, yeah. you know, incoming diplomat, foreign service officer, has had years of education and most of it focused on international relations and so on. So, uh, and and public diplomacy officers and foreign service go out, you know, with maybe a couple of weeks in the summer as training. But a psychological operations soldier gets a 44-week course, and they're they're very. Uh, I mean, it covers a lot, um, and uh, some of it is you know how to, how to uh, means of communication and use posters, you know how to design a leaflet. There's some of that, but there's also uh, thinking about cultures and and thinking about um, psychology. Uh, so I I think that the your psychological operation soldiers uh, are you know are going to be pretty straight shooters, but any but I but I'm not the best to tell you. To sure, I think you're more about uh, enemy commanders. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. also, I'm going to sidestep that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. That'll be our last question. Please. Yeah, no, yeah, our last question right here. Sir, uh, the 
I noticed your repulsion about uh, going into the gray and the black, and this idea of truth. Oh, yes. Is it, is it because you're, we want to protect the legitimacy? Is that your main concern, or is there something else? And I, part two of that is, yeah. in the, at, what's the value of truth in information uh, as, a, as a power in a time where we don't have the same language, same culture, and there is uh, truth that is quote unquote in the eye of the beholder. Oh, wow. <laughs> Whoa, wrap it up. He does that all the time. Wrap it up. <laughs> um, no, I got the, the second part. So the, the first part was. What are you trying to protect with? Oh, yes. Okay. What we're trying to protect white. is credibility. Credibility. And you can, there are different words, but credibility is the thing. And uh, I, I've got slides where I, you know, baked into public diplomacy, for instance, is the thinking of Edward R. Murrow, uh, who was uh, the what, President Kennedy's director of the U.S. Information Agency. And credibility, you know, if you don't have credibility, then nothing you say is going to be believed. So, the, so keeping on to truthful communication, attributed communication, is one way to establish that credibility. And I count it, I weigh it pretty heavily. Now, as far as the many varieties of truth, or the many languages of truth, or whatever, uh, yes, we can all watch Rashomon and you know see the case from seven different points of view, and uh, and yeah, you've got your truth, I got my truth, and cultures interpret it this way or that way. I'm just not, I'm just not onto this. Uh, the now, I'm all for understanding culture and being able to, to understand the way other peoples and societies communicate. But I don't want to see the day when we jump away from the idea that there's, that there's something that's true. Uh, and uh, because it can be, uh, it's, you know, it's, it can be checked by reality. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's a short answer to a very large question. <laughs> Very large. Credibility is the word. Let's thank Mr. Bishop for <laughs> Also, thank you to the Marine Corps University Foundation for making this happen and having him as a chair at the Marine Corps University, but also bringing him here. So we appreciate that as well. And then thank you guys. So thank you.